we, a while ago, I had this idea of having these, uh, we, we always do historic stuff, you know, and, and historic books and architecture. So I thought, yeah, there's so many interesting people in this area that why not just, you know, see if, they're being, if they'd be interested. So the, Linda's being our guinea pig. This is the first, speakers of, this first speaker of the speaker series. So we're so happy that she's done this. And I thought, let me reach out to her. And she said, yes. Anytime. So happy to do this. So thank God for the internet because this, uh, I didn't do any of this research. This is right off the internet. So I'm going to read and then uh, you will just, just jump, jump in. in and say things if okay. you want. <laughs> So, uh, as we know, I'm going to read this part first. So, Linda Wolverton uh, is an American screenwriter, playwright, and novelist whose most prominent works include screenplays and books of several acclaimed Disney films and stage musicals. She's the first woman to have written an animated feature for Beauty and the Beast, 1991, which is also the first animated film ever to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. She also co-wrote the screenplay of The Lion King in 94, provided additional story material for Mulan in 98, and adapted her own Beauty and the Beast screenplay into the book of the Broadway adaptation of the film, for which she received a Tony Award nomination and won an Olivier Award. Her recent work includes the screenplays for Alice in Wonderland 2010 and Maleficent in 2014, both of which had, were significant box office successes. The former made her the first female screenwriter with a sole writing credit on a film that grossed $1 billion. And I know that we, we emphasize that a lot in the well, MailChimp yes. flyer that went out. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there. All right. That was Alice. That was Alice. That was Alice. Alice yeah. um, so I'm going to start. We're going to come back to these these movies, but we're going to start with your early life in education, if you don't mind. I feel like this is your life. <laughs> this is your this life, is, Linda Wolverton. Might be the boring part. <laughs> As a child, she began she began acting in the local. She was born in Long Beach, California. Oh. Do you want to say anything about Long Beach? I love Long Beach. Yeah. What part of Long Beach? I do, grew up in Naples, you know, oh, the yeah. canal. Yeah. Love Naples. Yeah, so my, my front, you know, the street was a canal. It was okay. water. Yeah. It was very cool. It was a great place to grow up. I just went on a tour of Naples. Like, with the, buildings yes. there. A lot of buildings. And then they do that, the gondola thing now. Yes. But not then, but that, yeah, it was great. We just went on a tour there last year, yeah. as a matter of fact. Oh, that's a lovely spot to grow up in. All right, so as a child, she began acting in a local children's theater as an escape from what she uh, described. No, I'm, I, I forget about that one. She graduated from high school in uh, 69 with honors in... 70. In 70. Why? With, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> with honors in the school's yeah. theater program. She attended the California's, uh, California State University of Long Beach, graduated with a BFA in theater arts in 1973. After college graduation, she attended the California State University of Fullerton to receive a master's degree in theater for children. So yes, there. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right, and so first works. Um, upon completion of her master's, Wolverton formed her own children's theater company. She wrote, was it just, no, it wasn't just children, it was adults playing to children. No, yes, it was adults playing to children. It was. Um, it was a small little company. I wrote all the little plays. It was based on animals a lot. And we toured into shopping malls and schools and churches. No prisons? No, well, no. <laughs> uh, and what's the interesting thing about it is that there's like three of us who played all the parts. I, I wrote them all. And, um, and I'm in a, a shopping mall. Now, shopping malls have no acoustics. You no. can't, nothing. So I'm in, a, I'm in a shopping mall with a little carpet up on a little platform, and I'm playing a turtle. <laughs> so I I was uh, I wore a, a, a kid's wading pool on my back to be like the shell of the turtle and I was all green and in this costume and my acting partner was with me and we were emoting as turtles and um, I looked down and it took a lot of effort you know there was a lot of effort we didn't get paid very much money and I looked down and there were like three kids and one of them was crying one of them was a, a snot and one of them was like <laughs> ice cream, and they couldn't hear me anyway. And I'm thinking, there's got to be a way to reach more kids than this. <laughs> there has to be some way. So I disbanded it oh. and moved here. Because oh. <laughs> it was like, there's got to be a path to reach more kids than this, because it took a lot of effort, mm -hmm. you know? So. You certainly, by the end of this, you certainly reached a lot of children <laughs> with that decision. 
So she wrote, uh, directed, and performed all over California in churches. She also began to work as a creative drama instructor in 79. In 1980, she began working as a secretary at CBS, where she eventually became a programming executive, concentrating on both children's and late night programming. During her lunch breaks, you've heard disciplines. This is a really good, if this is true. During her <laughs> lunch breaks, Wolverton wrote her first novel. That's what this is. There is. Her first novel, The Young Adult Starwind. Right. Yes, for y young adult uh, book, Starwind. After quitting her job in 84, she started working as a substitute teacher. She wrote her second novel which is this, uh, the also young adult uh, Running Before the Wind. And that was released in 86 and 87, respectively. Both were published by Houghton Mifflin. Can I go back about the yes. long lunch, lunches? Yes. So I worked at CBS on a desk for executives. And executives back then took two, two and a half hour lunches, <laughs> right? So in the beginning, I would go to lunch with my friends, and we'd talk about our boyfriends and hair and stuff. And then I thought, well, I had this two hours in my life that is just really kind of empty. And I thought, I'm just going to write a book. So, and my desk was in the hallway. So it wasn't, there was no <laughs> private place. So I wrote on a selectric oh, typewriter, I wrote the, the first book um, in the hallway at lunch. <laughs> oh my God. How long did it take you to do that one? The, uh, that one, a, probably a couple months. Um, yeah. And you're just very disciplined about it. That's great. That you yeah. Focus. You're focused. And John Wilborn, how are you? Oh, a little late. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's fine. Um, all right, so during this time, Wolverton began penning children's, let me go to the next one, began penning children's scripts for children's television shows. From 86 to 89, she wrote episodes for animated series as Star Wars, Ewoks, uh, Dennis the Menace, The Real Ghostbusters, Berenstain Bears, I love the Barons. Yeah. My Little Pony, and Chippendale Rescues Rangers. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about Those were the good old days. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, it was so much fun. You just, you know, played. And then this is before the internet. And so my friends and my colleagues in the world of, of uh, Saturday morning cartoons were also kind of science fiction-y kind of people, so they're very high techy people, geeky techy people. So they figured out how to do use the modem to you know email in quotes to modem in your script. This is way oh. early, early, early. Oh. Yeah. So it was so cool because I would write this thing and just push the button, and there it went. I never had to see it again, <laughs> and I got a check for five hundred dollars. <laughs> So it was like so cool, yeah. And then oh, by sometimes I would sit and watch it on Saturday morning. But it was that was fun, really sweet, fun. Sweet, yeah, sweet. Yeah, no pressure. So after that, she grew tired of writing for animated television shows. She expressed interest in working for Disney's theatrical animation studio. I love this part. But was discouraged by her agent, who assessed that she, in quotes, wasn't ready. Not agreeing with it, Wolverton went over to Disney's offices in Burbank. Uh, and dropped off a copy of a, a book, Running Before the Wind, to a secretary, asking her to, in quotes, give it to somebody to read. <laughs> Two days later, is this true? Yeah, it's true. Okay. Yeah. Two days later, she received a call from Jeffrey Katzenberg. No, wow. that's not true. That's not true. Shut up, that. That's not bad. What are you talking about? That's no, like, that, that part, but it wasn't Jeffrey Katzenberg, it was another executive. Oh, well, so, so I, I walked boldly, <laughs> I boldly walked into this, you know, the, the now there's the, um, the dwarf building on the lot, mm -hmm. right? Well, this is be prior to the dwarf building, and the animation was way, way out in um, Glendale, and it was like the, the poor stepchild of the studio. Mm -hmm. So I just, there's no guards. So I just drove on to the, there, into the lot, and I walked in, no guards stopped me, and I went up to the receptionist, and I said, maybe somebody here wants to read this. It was running before the wind. And, That's amazing. That's a good story. And, and then two days later, this executive calls me and says, you have to come and work for us. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's still nice, even if it wasn't Jeffrey Katzenberg. It wasn't Jeffrey Katzenberg. So he scheduled her for an interview. All right, so it's now working for Disney. All right, so Wolverton was hired to write the script for Disney's feature animation, Beauty and the Beast, as we all know. That one, yeah. Thus becoming the first woman to write an animated feature for the studio. Actually, you know, when I met you at the home on Windsor, um, uh, Hal Ashman? Howard? Howard, actually. 
he pa just passed, passed away. Yeah. And you, I remember you said he, he mentored you. Totally. A lot. He was a lovely guy. Howard Ashman, you know, was an ingenious uh, lyricist who uh, wrote uh, on Broadway Little Shop of Horrors mm -hmm. with Alan Menken. Great. That was back in the early. Then they decided to try doing animation and kind of make animation into like a Broadway musical, which is what beauty I mean, totally was. Right. Absolutely. But Howard was ill and he hadn't told anyone. <clears throat> he had HIV and um, so he couldn't write the script. If he hadn't been sick, he would have written it himself. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't have been able to do I it? I wouldn't have been able to oh, do I it. See. Okay. But he, what happened was they just kind of plunked me. Just, I mean, I'm nobody. I'm from Long Beach, you know. <laughs> uh, 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 they, they just plunked me in the presence of Howard Ashman, who was this genius. And I feel like I benefited from the his, end of his life, sort of passing, passing it on. He never would have chosen me to pass it on to, you know, because I was just, just nobody. But it, it, I was there, and we got along great. And um, I feel incredibly blessed to have known him and work with him. And I feel like I learned so much that has carried me all the way through because mm -hmm. of Howard. Yeah. And I certainly was watching over you. Yeah, absolutely. This, yeah. You know. Critically. And he passed away during the this. Before the movie was for, was released in ninety one. Yeah. Interesting. He, he interesting. Died. Um, so from early 1985 um, to 88, two different teams of writers uh, had taken a turn at adapting Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont's a Tale into a feature film, but Wolverton succeeded by incorporating her own ideas into the story, such as making the protagonist a bookaholic. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> which was great, which was great. Was yeah, I have a story about that. So Disney is all about, you know, what is what is the what is the hobby that the that our protagonist does? And they went in Bell to have a hobby. And I reading, Howard and I were both all about making our heroine a reader. And they said, well, uh, reading is too static, uh, an occupation, it's just too boring to have someone sit around and read. So I remember back in my childhood in Naples, I used to walk to the store reading my book to get milk from my mom or whatever, I didn't want to stop reading. So I would walk reading, buy the milk, keep reading, keep pay the money, keep reading all the way home. So I thought, okay, so we'll just, we'll just send her through town, right? reading her book. And we, they it worked, bought it. It we, was physical and moved did they want What other hobbies did they suggest for her to do? Were there any? Oh, they had a lot of hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> Laundry. <laughs> Cake baking. Oh really? Putting up laundry on the thing. I remember this. Yeah. Oh, that's a hobby. That's a hobby. That's a chore. Yeah. Upon its release in 80, in 91, Beauty and the Beast received universal critical acclaim, becoming the first animated film ever to be nominated for the Academy Award and winning the Golden Globe Award for Best Best Motion Picture Musical or Comedy. Oh, I have a couple more slides. Hold on. I got this thing. I have to do two things at once here. Yeah. So sweet. <laughs> and there's <laughs> some coffees there. Um, okay. Um, She's gonna eat it. She's gonna eat it. Let's don't let the end. They said um, I wrote a script with a really emotive beast, and you know he had feelings, yes. and 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 pain, and the animator said you know we can't animate uh, that much emotion. Really? They said we can't do it. They, it was hand drawn then, you know? mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, you can try. I'm going to give you this much emotion, and as much as you can do, do. But I'm not going to hold myself back because you can't draw it. <laughs> so you do your best. I'm kind of badass when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yes. Okay. I know. Well, it was. I mean, all these characters. Even while he was the beast, you loved him because he was so. He was a charming beast." Tell me, beast. Um, all right. So then, there we go. Let's see that. And then, of course, he becomes Prince Charming at the end of that. Mm -hmm. All right. And there's that. And they're the happily ever after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sweet. Oh, sweet. A lot of people like the beast better. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Uh, the success of Beauty and the Beast led Wolverton to work in several projects, projects with Disney. She co wrote the screenplay of the live-action film Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey, released in 93, 
and worked again with Disney Animation by helping the pre-production story development of Aladdin, which was released in 92. Here we go, I have Aladdin there. I love Aladdin, all my kids were young during these movies. It was so much fun. There we go, and it was released in 92. Uh, Co-writing the, oh, that's some more Aladdin. You know, my, one time, I, one of my kids, I went into the room and they were like, oh, it's Jafar. So I saw this and I thought, they meant me, that I was Jafar. <laughs> so this reminded me about that. I'm wondering which one of my sons it was. Okay. So um, what about, uh, tell us about Aladdin. Anything about Aladdin? Uh, I, you know, it was just early development with Howard. I was working with Howard. And, um, so I, did, I didn't make a huge contribution to Aladdin. Okay. All right. Then we go on. There they go. What wonderful music. Such wonderful music. Yeah. So both of these. Here we go. All right. So we're going on with The Lion King. So, um, released in, that was uh, and co-writing the screenplay of The Lion King, which was released in '94. Both Aladdin and The Lion King were noted box office successes and received critical acclaim. During this time, she adapted her own uh, Be Beauty and the Beast screenplay into a Broadway musical. Well, I have a slide on there, but we do have a few more slides of Lion. King. So, The Lion King was a there was a script that was called King of the Jungle, that was written by. Um, a, a screenwriter was was very dense. It was just not a animatable, really. Mm. So they brought me in, and we and we basically threw everything out and started again about because Jeffrey Katzenberg wanted to do a coming of age of a lion cub in Africa, and there had been this incredible uh, research uh, done on you know just uh, ex experimental artwork done. So it was clearly a world that would just be amazing to do, but we didn't have a story. Mm. Um, so he went through this coming of age. Um, so we started working the way through through the ideas, and um, then at one point, at the time, uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero of a Thousand Faces was a really big deal in Hollywood. You know, it's like you had to analyze everything as per Joseph Campbell. So at one point, we were working on the story. So Jeffrey says he he throws the Joseph Campbell book at me. Says just analyze it over the weekend. Mm. That's how he, he was badass too. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I was writing. I was I was writing this memo about how the Lion King follows the story of, of you know hero's journey, and then I realized that you know not really, because in, in my memo I wrote you know now here we veer into Shakespeare territory, because really in the end, Simba it really is so much Hamlet, you know which I was like sh really an advocate for, so I still have the memo. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Okay. During this, all right, so here we go. We have, oh, here we go. During this time, she also adapted her own Beauty and the Beast screenplay into a Broadway musical, which opened to critical acclaim in '94. Uh, so it didn't tell. open to critical acclaim. It was panned. Really? Panned. Isn't it still running? It's like yes. Still yes. Running. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was panned by the critics. It was panned by the yeah. critics. Well, didn't, who cares about that? Well, yes. you know, <laughs> you know, but the people came anyway. Like we had horrible reviews, and people came anyway. And it really did, whether I'm proud of it or not, change the change the face of Broadway. It, it brought Disney into the into into Broadway, which is however you feel about that, you know. Um, so did the Lion King happen? Didn't the Lion King post. happen before this? No, after. Oh, really? Oh, that was afterwards. But Julie Taymor was a critical darling because she was doing a lot of puppetry right. off Broadway, right. which was really incredible. So they didn't have quite the pushback that we got for Beauty. Um, and now, uh, Beauty is, it ran around the world several times, yeah. it's been everywhere, and now we're redoing it. We're completely reinventing it, throwing kind of almost everything out except for the book and the music. And you're involved in that? Uh-huh, yeah. I, I did it all, and we opened in Bristol during the pandemic, in Bristol in the UK, and we're touring now, and we're now, like, huge, great reviews. Oh, nice. So I'm really happy. No, oh, it's, it's a lovely show, and when you saw the movie, you knew that this was you know, a Broadway musical, because the music was so delightful from the movie. So, all right. Um, so, uh, which opened in, in 1994, uh, leading her to be nominated for uh, Tony. And I re actually, I was watching Tony Awards, and I remember that night. And who won instead of you? Although you are a winner, who won that night? Who? Instead of me? Yes, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Was Stephen Sondheim did a, he was there. I was in the front row, mm -hmm. and they had little arrows. They kind of cheat. <laughs> what do you mean? Tell they us. They had arrows. So I'm, I got put in the front row, right next to the aisle, and I think, oh, I'm going to win. <laughs> 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 I got nervous. Oh, my God, I'm going to win. 
because they lives on the aisle right here. But the arrows, and I was with my ex-husband, and he sat down, and we both saw these arrows, and they weren't pointing to me. Oh, wow. It was for the camera. Oh, oh okay. really? They had, uh, yeah. So they know ahead they of time. Knew. So they knew. Bastards. So the point, the arrow was pointing at the person over there. So I, I remember just going, oh. Yeah. Who was that person? <laughs> was it Stephen Sondheim? No, it, well, he didn't write the book for whatever. Uh, James Lapine. That's what it was. James Lapine won for uh, a show. Uh, assassins or something? No, park some, with no. Or, no, no. Into no. the Woods. Something that wasn't that was not a hit. Passion. It was called Passion. Passion. Yes. Passion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Passion. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it wasn't a hit though. And that was with starring who? It was starring um, the gal that's in Marion Maisie and, and Donna Murphy. And Don, Don Murphy, Murphy, yeah. Don yeah who's she was playing like, Lady Astor in the, um, in the Gilded, Gilded Age. Age. Yes, yes, right now. Yes. There we go. Huh. Interesting. All right. Yeah. All right. So, but it was, it was sad because it was like, oh, the arrows aren't pointing to me. <laughs> I think that's a good story. You should oh, you spill the beans about that. <laughs> Cause some problems. All right. So, um, there were words. There a critical kind of leader. All right. Uh, but you did win the Olivier Award, which was nice. Um, so she provided additional story material for Mulan. I have Mulan here too. Hold on. Oh wait, let's get through these. I had to do the play ball one too. Boring, boring, boring. I love that script. And actually, these aren't all Broadway. These are uh, the these touring are, company yeah, and um, yeah. just everywhere. Exactly. Those costumes are incredible. Mm -hmm. Lovely show. Here we go. Uh, I think the last one. And then oh here we go. Well, I had a bunch of these. Okay. <laughs> We have a pretty woke version of it now, actually. Oh, really? Um, well, I had to go through the whole script because Disney is very, very, very woke. I've mm -hmm. been hearing very about woke. this lately, yes. So I had to go through the whole script and take out any reference to girl mm -hmm. because girl is di diminutive. And, um, so there's, it's all through the script. They call her the girl, girl this, and what about the girl and the girl. So I had to go through the whole thing and change the girl. And then uh, when I got over there to Bristol, they had done sort of this, like, you know, uh, an email out. Anybody have any objection about anything at all, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> so there was an objection to the word master. So I had to go, and they called her, him master the whole, the whole thing, because he's the master of the castle. Okay. Now I'm the master of the castle. So I had to, we had to go back and refigure some other name, word for master, or without letting, you couldn't let in, let on that he was a prince. He because the primary bedroom of the castle. I had to be the primary bedroom of the castle, as you guys all know about that. So it was, it's, and then we have, you know, we have a um, African American beast and a biracial um, LGBTQ uh, bell. Mm -hmm. So we have a big, uh, very woke production. Wow, interesting. I know I just heard that uh, Disneyland, uh, you can't say, you know, there's that announcement, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, they're, they're doing away with that completely. Yeah, they can't say that. Yeah. Isn't that nice? What are they going to say? Sorry, God knows. Something else. Something like, <laughs> you know, it'll hello dreamers. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There we go. That's it. That's not bad, exactly. That's not terrible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so then we go on to Mulan. Here we go, Mulan. My daughter loves this. One of her favorites. Um, yeah, she's pretty great. Provided additional story material for Mulan, released in '98, and co-wrote the book of the stage musical Aida, which I have. Oh, I have a yeah, couple yeah, pictures. Aida. Well, I have a couple <laughs> pictures of Mulan in here too. Mulan, Mulan. She's cutting her hair. Why is she cutting her hair? She's this in disguise as a man. Yeah. Oh. She goes into the service as a boy. You can tell that I have never seen this. <laughs> yeah. I can tell. Get it. All right. Oh, and then here we have then Aida. So you did the book of the stage musical Aida, which yeah. opened on Broadway in 2002. Critical acclaim, or not? <laughs> yeah. Or not? Okay. Tell us, tell us, no. Just okay. ruined the whole story. Well, we had two directors. One version we were in, we went to um, Atlanta, and we had one version of the show which was not critical acclaim. Then we got a new director um, and reinvented the show, and then we did get critical acclaim. And it ran for like four or five years, I think. Nice. And were they there while you were doing this, Elton John and Tim Rice? They were there. They're always around. They're yeah. always around. Oh, great. Nice. Well, Tim Rice wrote uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, right? Yeah. Didn't he? With and chess right. and all kinds of great things. Yes, yes. 
Nice. All right, so in 2007, she completed a screenplay where an older Alice from Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland returns to Wonderland from an idea she had in her head for many years. You had it in your head for many years? No. No, all right. She no, that there's a good screen. story about that. Go so, so, so my, my agent at the time uh, met with some Disney executives, and they said, we're looking for, you know, big tent pole uh, movie ideas. Family movie ideas. So um, he he said, I think Linda has a movie about Alice, an idea about Alice in Wonderland. So he called me and said, do you have a movie, an idea about Alice in Wonderland? I said, no. <laughs> Can you get an idea about Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> I said, by when? So I said, set the meeting, back me up, I'll, I'll be ready. And that, this is, this that is one, what yeah. happened. Well, yeah. that was good. Uh -huh. Was Johnny Depp your idea? Right no, he wasn't. I didn't. I didn't uh, write for him, but um, uh, he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. That whole film. And Tim Burton too, right? Yeah, Tim was amazing. Tim, I, yeah. He was amazing. Uh, he's such a genius. The thing about Tim is um, he puts on that he's crazy, but he's not. He's not. So, like, he, with the executives, he's all kind of like, I don't know. Eh, 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 eh. And then they leave, and he's like, okay, okay so here's what I'm gonna do. You do this, you do this. So it's all a big act. <laughs> it's great because they're scared of him. I never knew he was a kid from Burbank no, he's for just, many years. He's and fantastic. He's, yeah, he's yeah. Just, I saw that exhibit at uh, the museum. I went twice. It just was so fascinating to me. I love, I love all of his stuff. So she completed. All right. So, blah, blah. so where are we? From an idea she had in her head many years. She presented the screenplay to producers Suzanne Todd, Jennifer Todd, and Joe Roth, who took it to Disney. The studio immediately accepted the project, attaching Tim Burton to direct. Released in 2010, Alice in Wonderland earned more than one billion at worldwide box office. The, Megan Wolverton, for go ahead. The, the thing about it is that at the time, no one trusted that a, a, a female protagonist could make any money at the box office. Mm -hmm. So um, they kept pulling the budget back because they were afraid. So Dick Zanuck, who was the was the producer. Passed away, right? Passed away, yeah. He was amazing. But he would call me and say, we have to get the budget down. Take some things out. Take some out. That's like I've taken everything I can possibly take out. It was 120 pages. It came down to 89 pages mm -hmm. because Disney, because of all the special effects costs a lot. Um, but Disney was afraid that uh, the, they were going to throw money away on a female protagonist. So a billion dollars later, mm -hmm. all of their movies are female. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. All right. Um, in 2010, Disney invited her to write the screen screenplay of Maleficent. Oh, I think I have some oh, words. Boy. Alice in Wonderland. Yes, uh, I love all the makeup too. It's wonderful. Yeah. She was great. All right, Maleficent. So they came to me and said, we have, do you have any ideas for, we're thinking about making Maleficent, doing a retelling of Maleficent. Um, do you have any ideas for that? And I said, give me a second. And I walked away and thought about it. And I said, nope, I don't. Because <laughs> she, she threatens a baby with death. She's going to kill a baby. So how do you make somebody like that sympathetic? You can't. How can you do that? Right, right. So, then I went back and I looked at the at the anime, the cartoon of um, uh, Sleeping Beauty, and I had thought I had always believed that the witch was a witch, you know, that Maleficent was a witch, right, sure. but she was a fairy, right? Because there's the little fairies that fly around, and they say she's a fairy. I thought, well, if she's a fairy, where her are her wings? What happened to her wings? And f for me, that opened the whole thing. Hmm. Because someone stole her soul, which was her wings, and that would make you mad enough to threaten some, that person's child. So once I could start going down that path, mm. then I could make empathy for this character, and we didn't have her kill the baby anyway. But um, so it was a really interesting way of going about creating a protagonist out of someone that you never would have thought possible. So that it was you care the about. Uh, Princess Aurora's parents or father that? Yes. Cut her wings off. I see. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Good. Cut her wings right off. You wouldn't have thought Disney would do that. No. <laughs> and today they wouldn't do it. <laughs> they wouldn't do it today. They slipped right in. 
<laughs> and there was a moment between regimes, you know, we just slipped that well, right why, in. Why, why are you saying they wouldn't do it today? Violent. Oh, you can't do any violence. And it was like date rape because he drugged her first. Oh, yeah. I have to watch this again. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, you dragged her first. Yeah. So, yeah, that would never happen today. Mm. Oh, all right. Um, retelling of the animated film Sleeping Beauty from the point of view of the titular, titular villain. As with Beauty and the Beast, the film had been in developmental hell until Wolverton was attached to write it. She later described her version of the tale as a complete reinvention, not just the retelling of the same story. And it was released in 2014. All right, let me go through. We have a few pictures here. Here we go. Uh, and the costumes were great. She looked terrific in this. Mm. She was so wicked. Mm -hmm. She was great to work with, too. Mm. And that's when she's doing the... There you go. Oh, oh my lord. There you go. <laughs> 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 all right. Um, all right, so then there's other works. Wolverton wrote the book of the, uh, book of the Broadway musical at Stat. An adaptation of the Vampire Big Chronicles, crashing disaster, <laughs> which pre uh, debuted in 2005 in San Francisco, um, and then became the highest earning pre Broadway play in the city's history. The musical opened on Broadway in 2006. Crashing <clears throat> disaster. She co-wrote the narration script of the National Geographic theatrical documentary film Arctic Tale, released in 2007. Uh, in 2014, she announced that she was pitching a pilot for a television series. Um, it was later announced that Lifetime had decided to adapt the novel The Clan of the Cave Bear. Is this something we should go into? Yeah. No. All right. All right. So there was this little piece over here. And I said to her yesterday. I said, "Look, I'm just taking this from the internet." So I said, "They they said that you said this. Did you say this?" She said, "Let me look." So she said, "Yes." All right. So this is um, uh, a strong female character. They asked her what she thought. She said, "It means somebody who is this is in quotes pro proactive in their world, who affects their world, isn't a victim, isn't even victimized by it, or if they are victimized by it, they take action to change that for themselves." They look at the world in interesting ways, maybe in another way than the culture does. That makes a strong woman if she's vocal about it and, or even goes about trying to make changes without being vocal about it. There are so many interesting ways to describe women besides, this was really good, just strong. Because that was the key word for right. years. Strong. We strong, still have that Strong issue. women, strong women. Yeah. Uh, besides just strong, even the pure, difficult strength, it's strong-willed. That was very well said, I thought. I, I, a lot, thematically for Maleficent, I really thought it was important to show women in all of their colors and not just, you know, love interest or always nice or whatever. Yeah, because women are like that. Yeah. Right. Women are, you know, like men, you know. <laughs> all, Don't say all that. different. Yeah. And it also was really important for me. I was really, I felt strongly about the fact that there's not just one kind of love. Love isn't just romantic love. And the power of that is in Maleficent. This is a love for a child. Her love for her child is will break the spell. This is the most powerful love in the world. So I just I just thought it was important that because romantic love is always revered as like the love, but there's so many other kinds of love that are just as wonderful and just as powerful. And um, so those are my two themes for Maleficent. And, and the ending was different. I mean, it was. The princess didn't go off with the guy, right? As I recall, she there were you indicated that kind of love. There was a mother's love. So yes, that's what happens at the end of the book. I will have to. See she, what she, she, the prince can't wake her up. Right. It, the spell can never be broken. The can't the prince can't wake her up, and they all give up, and Maleficent uh, apologizes to her, you know, for doing this to her. And um, it's actually, I was doing an interview with the LA Times <laughs> at the time, and uh, I was talking about that speech. She apologizes to, to, for, and she always loved her. Scout! <laughs> and uh, as I was talking to the LA Times, I started crying because I realized that a whole speech I had written, the whole movie I had written as an apology to my daughter for the divorce. Oh, wow. You don't realize that till later. And I, as I'm talking, the whole speech was exactly that. And as I'm talking about it, it just came up. It just all came up. Then the reporter was crying. We were crying. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like a movie, though. You need to do something. 
<laughs> but so it's so so subconscious, you know. You you write you write your own life in in, in ways. Um, so yeah. Interesting. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, um, Wol Wolverton's works are known for their strong female characters. She's recognized for having paving the way inside Disney for the creation of strong female protagonists, mainly due to her writing of Belle, the protagonist of Beauty and the Beast. Belle is an intelligent and strong young woman, a Disney heroine who does, in quotes, something other than wait for her prince to come. Um, Empire, Empire hailed Belle as a feminist heroine who more rounded than previous Disney characters. Wolverton herself said that Belle moved us forward a few inches. She was a reader. She didn't rely on her beauty to get herself through the world. She wasn't a victim waiting for her prince to come. She was a proactive character. In Alice in Wonderland, she gave the protagonist Alice uh, Kingsley, uh, Kingsley? Kingsley, an adventurous, inquisitive, non-conforming personality which leads the character to question the values of Victorian society. Elle Magazine says, in her version of Wonderland, Wolverton gives audiences a female character that was not dependent on a man for happiness or commercial success. Describing her work in film, Wolverton said, my whole point uh, in Alice was that you have to forge your own path. You can't just go down somebody else's path. It's your dream. It's your life. You don't have to hold on by other people to what to make of yourself. You, you decide. Because when you go out to face the Jabberwocky, you go out alone. And right. we ought to face that, right, exactly. you know. Exactly. Uh, reflecting, this is the last part of this, reflecting on her female characters, Wolverton said, I came up as a feminist in my day, and when I first approached, I was first approached to do Beauty and the Beast, I knew that you couldn't do a throwback Disney victim heroine. We weren't going to be to buy in it as a woman after a whole awakening in the 70s. No one was going to accept that. So they started, that started me on a path uh, of looking at these Disney princesses in a sort of different way. I feel that you have to have an empowering message or you're not going to be uh, relevant. If you don't, if you're not relevant, on how, uh, if you don't stay relevant to how people are and how women are approaching life now, it's going, not going to be feeling true. Which is what, interesting because you look at Belle now and I think she's a little bit passe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're kind of past it. Well, so, yes. if and when we ever go to Broadway, don't tell anybody, um, we might go back. Um, I'm going to relook at it because I think we're kind of a little bit past the obviousness of, you know, um, girls don't read and, you know, all that stuff. I might have to re, re oh, re up, some other yeah, stuff. Re up it for today. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you have to stay relevant. Interesting. Now, what is this all about? I don't even remember this one. I know I did. Don't. Julian, <laughs> sure, you put that in there. I didn't know. Anyway, I know she, got, she got a lovely I award. Got award or something. There we go. Women's Image Award. There. I was happy. All right. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, I, we question and answers, right? Here yeah. we go. Yeah, so anybody else? When, when was Hermione Granger coming into existence time wise with your heroines? Oh, I don't know. Honestly, when she she showed up, I mean, they'd be the first book. That, but the first, yeah, the first, first Harry Potter book. book. So. Someplace in the in the probably between Alice and Maleficent or something mm -hmm. like that, you know. Yeah. Because that closing picks up on the 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 bell approach to you know full person. Right. She, yeah. She and the, and the intellect and she was a smart one of the group, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, she was. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. What other questions? This is a question. You have a question. I know you always have questions. Go ahead. Come on. Me? What do you have? Yes. Okay, yeah, I do have a question. Because yeah. <laughs> you talked about, I, I'm just curious, you talked about all the changes you had to make in Beauty and the Beast. You, had, you couldn't use the word girl anymore, you couldn't use the word master. So I'm just curious, what words did you come did up you come with up? to replace those? Well, first of all, <laughs> I, had to, I had to battle a little bit about the fact that if you know Beauty and the Beast, Gaston, He's a toxic male, all right? Mm -hmm. Toxic male. But the whole point is he's a toxic male. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So he has to be able to call her the girl. Because, I mean, I think we lose that sometimes. Like, sometimes you have to make the point by using the references that aren't, that aren't you know, appropriate. Right. And everyone can be perfect. That makes your right. character, you know, obviously. So uh, I let him say girl still. But I change, you know, we change it to young lady or, or uh, woman, young woman. We said a lot. Were there a lot of three and four year old women in the in, also in the plot? <laughs> right. I know, I know. And then master, we 
I think we ended up with highness. highness. So we ended up saying highness, I think. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was it was challenging. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. What are current projects in the last few years? Um, I am currently writing a movie called The Night Circus, based on a book that was uh, out of several years ago about a magical circus. I have a love story in a magical circus. That's really fun. I adapted Eloise, the book um, about the little girl who lives at the Plaza Hotel. Mm -hmm. That was really fun. Woke, as woke as you can get, <laughs> about a little rich girl who lives in a hotel. <laughs> um, and then I'm about to do a, a, a series for Disney. Uh, branded television, it's called now. It's not the Disney Channel anymore. It's a Disney branded television. Are these all animated projects? No, none of them are. I did an animated movie for Skydance called Spellbound that's going to come out, I think, next year. But animation takes a really long time, like four or five years. Yeah. Is it different for writing for animated characters rather than live characters? I don't think so. You have to imagine. I mean, if you all right. So when you did Beauty and the Beast, did they have the drawings of the characters, and you then you envisioned them in your mind no. when you were writing? No. So they, they all came afterwards. So you didn't have anyone in your mind. You didn't have any image of Belle or no. any of these guys. I didn't. No. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Sometimes I write for an actor. Like I def definitely wrote Maleficent for Angelina Jolie. Mm -hmm. she, she was attached. She was attached. Yeah. yeah, I definitely wrote that for her. Mm -hmm. I didn't write the Hatter for Johnny Depp. Didn't know. Who was being cast? Mm -hmm. No. Interesting. What other questions do we have? You have a question? Well, I kind of had a question that you touched on it when you were talking about emoting the beast, you know. Um, did you have your own images then, or you had no drawings to go by? You did not know what the characters were going to look like when you write the script? No. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I did. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a beast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when they actually start production as a writer, how much influence do you have? Do you sometimes lose influence as the writer, or did they engage you a lot? Because there's, because your scripts were so creative, they were. Um, animation is really tricky as a writer. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artist medium. Mm -hmm. It's all about the art. Mm -hmm. So the, the writer is, has less, um, can I say respect? <laughs> um, and what they'll do is, with beauty, I had to really fight hard because they take the script and, and every sequence is storyboarded. Mm -hmm. And the storyboard artists are, are talented people in their own right. And when in Walt's day, they would write the dialogue themselves. So that transition from, from the Disney uh, storyboard artist really pretty much doing it all to, to a screenplay um, which was what Jeffrey Katzenberg brought in, the idea of a, a screenplay. Um, it started with Little Mermaid. Um, it, was, it, was a hard, it was hard for the, anime, uh, for the storyboard artist to accept that. So they would just take my work and pitch it over their shoulder and do something else. Mm -hmm. So I would walk in, then, and how it works is then, they, then you, it's all up, and then they take this big pointer and they pitch the sequence and kind of act it out to the executives or whoever. And it was just amazing. There's nothing I had written was up there. <laughs> oh. um, so, but for me, I, as a writer, I didn't feel there was a singular voice in each one of these sequences. They all sounded like somebody else. You know, so there was no continuity. Um, so I really went to the mat a lot to get Belle to be Belle, to get the beast to be the beast. Um, I just, uh, I noticed that, you know, with all of the themes, the whole spectrum of different themes, that you have always done empowering messages or, like, creating for good, and, um, you know, and I wondered if you ever felt like that, this is sort of a Pollyanna thing to ask, but do you think that propelled you along further because you actually did write something that's worthwhile for people? And dogs. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I have a, a real strong feeling about that. I've, you know, there's millions and millions of dollars 
years and years of people's energy and into something. And I don't feel like, um, I don't want to waste that. And I don't want to write something that's just for entertain. Pure, uh, there's nothing wrong with pure entertainment at all. It lifts us in dark times, no question. But I always felt like art from, from you know, early, early days is about, um, is about moving our culture forward. That's what, we, that's what we go to plays to do, is to pity and fear, to, to, to learn something and to grow. And with a, with a megaphone the size of Disney, I feel a responsibility to make something significant. To, to touch people. Um, the reason that Alice in Wonderland made a billion dollars is because the little girls in China went back and back and back. Mm -hmm. Because they had lived in a culture where little girls were thrown away. So I, that's, you know, every single one, in fact, I don't have, I, I have to find that in it before I agree to do it. I was like, how is this gonna lift us in some way, nudge the culture? any tiny little way forward. Um, and if it doesn't have that, I'm kind of less interested. So it just doesn't seem as sort of significant and impactful. Awesome. And presumably, uh, <laughs> Jeffrey, <laughs> presumably Jeffrey Katzenberg also was interested in that direction. Presumably. Yeah. <laughs> it, it got done. So. Yeah, it got done. Yeah, absolutely. Got done. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. Lion King has taken on sort of like this sort of a mythic, this sort of mythic thing with Lion King, and, and I go, I think about that a lot. It's like, well, what is it about the Lion King? You know, what is it about this? Is the much of it's the music, yeah. but it's really about taking your place in the world, finding your your place, and and how you can affect the world, and how you can and a lot, and it has a lot to do with fathers and sons. It's very, very, it, it definitely impacts fathers and sons more, I would say, maybe, than girls and moms. Well, but life and death, circle of life. The circle of life, yeah, yeah, so. And, and, and frankly, I'd say the entire body of work is not just for children, so. A lot of adult audiences for everything animated that you wrote. Well, you know, the, the mandate at Disney was 8 to 80. <laughs> so how, do you, how do you appeal to an eight-year-old and an eighty-year-old at the same time? You know, that was the thing. Eight to eighty. Was that because they they knew their grandparents were going to be taking their grandchildren? Yeah, because that's the Disney audience. You know, so you have to hit the kids here, but do stuff over here, up here, so that the the adults aren't bored. You know, so that's challenging. Well, all the things you're talking about are just from literature. You could be talking about Greek myths, or you could be talking about Shakespeare and the Renaissance, and that's what you're talking about, is elevating your writing into that area of literature, not just pleasure reading. Like, you know, it's amazing. Well, I hope so, anyway. What other questions do we have? There we go. Richard, you want to go first? No, no, you, uh, I'm pointing to you. The, actually, I've, I've, I've got three quick parts. Richard, I love this format. Do you like it? It's fantastic. All right, cool. I, I, I'm loving it. Linda. You know for thank, questions? <laughs> no, hi. The, hi. Thank you for hosting. Yes. Um, you said something very interesting to me, in particular, uh, all the little girls going back to see the movie in China. Are there, but, and I can tell you love what you do. You're, you're heartfelt with what you do. But are there writers out there that follow politics and write strictly in hopes of making a hit and making uh, a, a big payoff? Yeah. Okay, so that, 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 that's, that's, a, that, that's in front of all of us. Yeah, I, <coughs> I mean, I'm not judging anybody. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody has to feed their family. And, sure. You know, a lot of the, a lot of people get into screenwriting is because they can get you know they and there's a lot of formats you know there's a lot of books out about how to write a screenplay you know there's the save the cat and there's there's just all these things so you, you know you can write a screenplay with this formula and then we'll have a hit movie and it'll make a hundred million billion dollars and we'll be rich that's great great do that that's not what I do see I just found that people who love what they do it's much better material whatever the, you know the venue is. And my last part is, 
did you write the design of your house? I'm, I'm loving your house. Oh, how, really? does that, how does that relate I, to the writer in you? It's romantic. Yeah. Right? It's very elegant. It's, it's female and it's romantic. You know, I look at her and I'm like, oh yeah, it's very kind of this, and, and I like antiquity, obviously, and I like history. So, um, and I, every time I come down the stairs in this house, all these beautiful houses in Hancock Park, this one has this like sort of like this one piece wood winding, you know, down the, uh, the, the handle. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think of all the hands that came down there, the gloved hands for women, or men's hands, all sort of smooth that one piece of wood out that makes a little circle at the end. I think about that a lot, channeling. Well, yeah. did, did the okay. home pick you? Well, I, very possibly. because when I, when I lived at, on Windsor, I, I, I walk to think. That's how I just do my process. And um, I used to walk past this house. And, and love it. And there was a big tree in the front then. And, I, and there's, a, there's a smoking porch out here. Mm. And I used to walk past and there was no foliage. And I used to walk past thinking, now if I had that house, I would sit out there and write, right there on that smoking porch right there. So I thought about this house a lot. And then when I, when I lived in New York, I wanted to move back. And uh, my, my realtor, Sue Carr, um, said there's a house on Windsor you should come and look at it. And I was flying out to look at houses. And, and she told me the address, and I looked it up, and I made a mistake. I thought it was the house across the street. And I thought, now why would I buy the house across the street from the one that I really love? <laughs> this is the one I really love. So I almost didn't come. I thought it was that house. It turned out to be this house. Do you know the provenance? How old? Who, who, who 19, 1915. Oh yeah, you missed yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was an architect who built it. Mm -hmm. um, it was on the home tour like four years ago. Yeah. And so I'm a. Oh sure, yeah. Oh, this is perfect. Go ahead. So so uh, <laughs> when I, I renovated the house slightly, some from New York. When I was in New York, and we had to rebuild the chimney because it had fallen down during the earthquake, and you had to rebuild it as per right. 1915. <laughs> so in that process, the mantle, which was wood, got destroyed. So I had to find a new mantle, and I and I searched for. Uh, I wanted a limestone mantle. So I found this mantle in France, and I had it all measured, and it fit would fit the space. And it had to have its own passport to leave France. <laughs> so there was a lot of paperwork. And um, so the house was completely under renovation at the time. The mantle came, and then I flew out to see it. And my house, and there, and there was like this film of dust all over the whole house. And just, you know, just dusty in there. And my housekeeper was very upset. She was very, very upset. She said, you have to come see this. She was like hysterical upset. And we went in there, and there was little footprints. There were no children in the house in my life at the time. There were little footprints, like little in the dust, mm -hmm. leading away from the fireplace, <laughs> from the mantle, and stopped at the door mm -hmm. and didn't go back. Whoa. She was freaked out. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's a ghost. And she, she came with the mantle. It's a French ghost. She had to go home. <laughs> 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 it's true about the, the footprints, though. So did I you just, take a picture of that? I didn't. I didn't. But I figured she just came, woke up here, and had to go back where she lived. So. Uh, yeah. And that was the last time you saw anything like that? Yes, it, it, the house is not haunted. Oh. The house is enormously great energy. She's, it, she's been so great for me. A really, really good house creatively for me. Very nice. I write all over it. I write in all different mm -hmm. rooms everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. It's not too big for me. It's weird. I have three dogs in me, but it's nothing too big for me. It doesn't feel like it because I write all over it. That's perfect. Sweet. So you can carry a computer all around, or you yeah, my handle? laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. June Bilgore. I just uh, you do you've done such wonderful work. Are you ever amazed at what has come out of your head? 
<laughs> That's a loaded question. She is amazed with herself. Go ahead. I don't think it comes from It's not. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't, it doesn't come from me. It comes from someplace out there. It comes through me. It comes through this particular body with these hands and this brain and this is history. But these are ideas that need to be told. And I don't. I don't feel. I'm really spiritual about it. I don't feel like it's me at all. You know. I mean, the effort. The sweat and the guts and the blood and the arthritis in my hands from pounding the keyboard after 30 years is me, but the ideas that need to be told come from another place. I serve something else, you know. On that note, do you ever solve problems in your sleep and wake up and think, oh, I know what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes. Suzuka Kishin. <laughs> I'd like to commend you for what you did. Oh, because thank you. girls are always second class, no matter where you live. I come from the Middle East, and the teachers used to say, whoever did the uh, problem, let him go to the blackboard. I would be the first go to go to the blackboard, and the boys wanted to kill me. <laughs> yeah. So it is. Hats off to you. Thank you. For in a man's world, you succeeded and proved that we can do it no matter what. And we're still we very proud of you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, that bit really means a lot to me. Thank you so much. You know, and we're still struggling with it. We still struggle with it. You know, there's, the glass ceiling is still there. I have a very related question to that, which is, before you wrote Beauty and the Beast, you said your, your agent thought you weren't ready. How did you persevere? Because I think most people would say, oh, okay, I'm not ready, I'll just wait. How did well, you she had a lot of male clients that could get more money. Mm -hmm. And she was putting them to this. She was giving them, first of all, she's saying, well, they don't read Saturday morning writers. They don't really read Saturday morning writers, which is why I took my book. Mm -hmm. like, okay, so they're not going to read my cartoons, then I'll take my, my book. But she was just really sort of a, a female misogynist, you know. She, she really advanced her male clients. And um, I didn't buy it. Wasn't a girl named Sue. No, it wasn't a girl named Sue. She obviously didn't stay your agent after that. I no. <laughs> no. And what, and what other questions we have there? I'm just curious. Um, you mentioned the word woke a few times, and I'm wondering if you resent Disney telling you to go back through your screenplays and do that, or do you see it as, okay, this is part of what I need to do for the world? I think uh, there's woke and there's woke to a fault. Mm -hmm. I think that we might be walking into woke to a fault um, when, it's just a, when it starts to become for its own sake. Mm -hmm. And also to not honor, you know, I honor all of the, the animated movies before, before of, the, of the victim heroines, you know, the ones who were, who were suffered through it all but kept a smile on their face and the prince came and they talked to the little animals. I admire them and I respect them because they were indicative of their time. They represented what women were, what girls were held up to then. And they shouldn't be erased. We just have to look at it through the lens of, of today and it helps us understand the past. So, um, you know, when, when woke gets to the point that we start erasing, you know, our art, I do think that's too much. Um, so I don't, I don't really resent it um, very much. But there's obviously a reason, obviously. What other questions? We have another guy. Um, besides your own uh, impressive works, what uh, movies and plays interest you and you like to watch? I just saw the Layman trilogy. Oh, oh, yeah. So did Colleen's friend. It's really good. Mind boggling. Just mind boggling. Also, television is pretty amazing right now. You know, I honestly think that movies are kind of on the wane. Um, that television is is There's some good stuff on it. Incredible. Absolutely. Incredible writing, incredible performances, a great directing. I'm watching Vikings right now. Mm. Totally loving it. As good oh, as I, it. I've been watching that too. <laughs> as good as Game of Thrones, you know. So it's it's all it's all about storytelling. It's it's just the 
It's just the delivery system. It's like, how is this story going to get delivered? This is going to get delivered on the stage, or in a movie theater, or on your television. Now, when, what is the best medium for the story to get delivered? But isn't that a lot length related because you can have a longer story in a TV series? Than yeah, one definitely. One afternoon or something like that. Right, yeah. Which writers, besides yourself, do you love reading? I grew up reading just what I did. We didn't have a television. My dad was opposed to television, so we, ha we had to read. Uh, my, I love Rudyard Kipling. You know, uh, I, I love but all of the classics. Um, just You didn't have a TV when you were growing up? I didn't have a TV growing up, well, no. probably why you're such a good reader. Right. Did so, you resent him for that? Yes. Oh. And, and it was fun to go to my friend's house because there was a TV. I could watch stuff. Yeah. But um, I really pretty much love, love the classics. You know, um, I read mostly the classics, not so much modern material right now. Who else? Anybody else? Joseph, you must have a question. No, no, no. no. Thank you so much for having me.